Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program. Mario Ritter Jr. has a report on Sunday's riot in Brazil's capital. Later, you will hear this week's health and lifestyle report. We close the show with the next part of our U.S. history series, "The Making of a Nation." But first, here is Mario Ritter Jr. Brazil's president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva promised to bring those responsible for the violence to justice after the attack on Congress, the Supreme Court, and the presidential home in Brasilia. On Sunday, thousands of supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro broke windows, threw furniture, destroyed artwork. Stole objects and flooded offices during a three-hour riot in the capital area of Brasilia. Wearing green and yellow, the colors of the national flag, they were seeking to bring Bolsonaro back to power. Observers said the actions were like the January sixth attack on the U.S. Capitol building in 2021. The Associated Press reported that one video showed a group of protesters pushing through a police line with limited struggle. Only a few officers deployed pepper spray, a chemical often used to control crowds. Another showed officers standing by as protesters stormed Congress. Including one recording images on his phone. These vandals did what has never been done in the history of this country," said Lula, who defeated Bolsonaro in a closely fought election. All these people who did this will be found, and they will be punished. Lula blamed Bolsonaro for inciting his supporters. With unproven claims about possible election cheating, he said, "Everybody knows there are various speeches of the ex-president encouraging this." On Sunday, Bolsonaro was silent for nearly six hours about the events in Brasilia before rejecting Lula's accusation. He denied inciting his supporters. He said the rioters had crossed the line. Bolsonaro, who is now in the U.S. state of Florida, has yet to admit that he lost the election. He claimed that Brazil's electronic voting system was easy to misuse without offering any evidence, and his party's request to set aside ballots. Was dismissed in court. Bolsonaro's supporters still refuse to accept the results. Paulo Kalman is a political science professor at the University of Brasilia. He called Bolsonaro the Trump of Latin America, and compared his supporters' actions on January eighth in Brasilia. To the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January sixth, twenty twenty-one. Mario Sergio Lima is a political analyst at Medley Advisors, a policy research group. He said these groups were created by him, by the radicalism he imposed on politics. There is no way to undo that. Unlike the 2021 attack in the U.S., few Brazilian officials would have been working in the top government buildings on a Sunday. 
but the president's allies raised questions about how public security forces in Brasilia were so unprepared. They appeared to be easily overtaken by rioters who had been planning on social media for days to gather for weekend demonstrations. Taigo de Aragon is Director of Strategy at Brasilia-based Arco Advice, a research company. He said, Everyone knew they, the protesters, were coming to Brasilia. The expectation was that the federal district's government was going to mount a response to protect the capital. They didn't do any of that. Justice Minister Flavio Dino said the actions were the same as terrorism. He said officials were looking into who paid for the buses that transported protesters to the capital. They will not succeed in destroying Brazilian democracy, he said. Brazilian officials noted that the buildings would be searched for evidence including fingerprints and images. On Monday, the Justice Ministry said more than 1,200 people had been detained. Following the attack, many world leaders from Europe and Latin America voiced their support for Brazil's democratic government. U.S. President Joe Biden called the events an assault on democracy and on the peaceful transfer of power. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. United States health officials last week approved a new Alzheimer's drug. The drug, called Lakembi, is the first to slow the decline in memory by several months. The Alzheimer's Association describes Alzheimer's as a brain disease that causes a decline in memory, thinking, and reasoning skills. One of the most common signs of Alzheimer's disease is forgetting recently learned information or dates and events. People with the disease have difficulty doing things that they did before. Some may struggle with joining or following a discussion. The newly approved Lakembi is a long-needed new treatment for the disease. But experts warn that the drug is not a cure. Dr. Joy Snyder is a brain doctor at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. She said, This drug is not a cure. It doesn't stop people from getting worse but it does measurably slow the progression of the disease. She added, that might mean someone could have an extra six months to a year of being able to drive. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, approved the drug through a speedier-than-usual process. The process permits drugs to be launched based on early results. The drug is only for early-stage patients and requires an injection by health care workers every two weeks. It is not yet clear how much the drug can help people with the disease. There are also concerns about its safety. Still, it's a landmark, said Dr. Richard Hodes, director of the National Institute on Aging. It's not enough but it's encouraging that there's something we can do, he added. Lakembi is made by Japan's ASI and its U.S. partner, Biogen. The drug is designed to target and clear away beta amyloid, a substance that builds up in the brain and leads to Alzheimer's. Dr. Sam Gandhi is an Alzheimer's expert at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. He told the Associated Press that Lakembi targets a slightly different form of amyloid than other drugs that have sought to treat the disease. 
That might explain why Lakembi proved to be successful, while many other experimental drugs have failed. In 2021, U.S. health officials approved a similar drug named Aduhelm, even though studies never proved it really helped patients. The move led to criticism after a congressional investigation. In ASI's 18-month study of nearly 1,800 people, Lakembi appeared to delay early-stage patients from getting worse by about five months. The study measured people on an 18-point scale that follows their mental and functional abilities. People who got the drug still worsened, but not as quickly as those given an inactive substance. The difference was nearly half a point on that scale by the study's end. Experts are divided over how meaningful the difference is. Dr. Matthew Schrag is a neurology researcher at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. He said most patients won't notice the difference. Schrag and some other researchers believe a meaningful improvement would require at least a difference of one full point on the 18-point scale. Others say slowing the disease early on, when people still function well, is important. Hodes, the director of the National Institute on Aging, said, Several months with better cognition. What's that worth to you? He added, I think there you can get a strong argument. If I can interact with my family, be independent for months, that's a very meaningful outcome. Like other amyloid-targeting medications, Lakembi can cause brain swelling or small brain bleeds. In ASI's study, 13% of drug recipients had swelling, and 17% had small brain bleeds. The likely reason for this is that amyloid plaques usually form around nerve cells in the brain, but sometimes they get inside blood vessels, too. Several Lakembi users died while taking the drug, including two people who were on blood-thinning medication. ASI has said its Alzheimer's drug did not cause their deaths. But Gandhi, the Alzheimer's expert, said the greatest risk of serious bleeding would be among Lakembi users who take blood thinners. Older adults commonly take blood thinners to prevent or treat strokes. Patients also may experience reactions from the drug that could include high body temperature, an upset stomach, and changes in blood pressure. ASI said the drug should be available by January 23rd. A year's worth of treatment is expected to cost $26,500. If insurance companies cover the drug, however, most people will not have to pay anywhere near that. Ashley joins me now to talk a bit more about this week's health and lifestyle report. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Dan. Your report centered on the FDA's recent approval of Lakembi, a drug for patients in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Experts are quick to note that the drug is not a cure, but one doctor mentioned in the story, Richard Hodes, called the drug's approval a landmark. Can you explain what landmark means in this case? Of course. The word landmark has quite a few meanings. One meaning is a very important event or development. For example, the moon landing in 1969 was a landmark in space exploration. Dr. Hodes called Lakembi's approval a landmark because the drug is the first of its kind to show a slowdown in memory loss for early-stage Alzheimer's patients. Turning point and milestone have similar meanings. And what about other meanings of landmark? Well, if we look at the word itself, it is made up of two words put together, land and mark. This offers a clue for other meanings of the word. 
One is something that is used to mark the boundary of land. Another meaning is a structure or object on land that is easy to see or recognize. There are many famous landmarks around the world. The Statue of Liberty is a landmark in New York City, and a landmark in Paris, France, is the Eiffel Tower. It's clear now that landmark has many meanings. Thanks for explaining some of them for our listeners. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan. The Making of a Nation, a program in special English. I'm Kay Gallant. Today, Harry Monroe and I continue the story of America's Civil War. By the autumn of 1864, it appeared that the North would defeat the South in the war between the states. The southern army needed men and supplies. There was little hope of getting enough of either to win. The northern army was stronger and better equipped, but it too had suffered. Much of the death and destruction was the result of new military technology. A new kind of bullet had been invented. It was called the mini-ball. It made the gun a much more deadly weapon. Before the mini-ball, few soldiers could hit a target more than 30 meters away. With the new bullet, they could hit targets more than 150 meters away. Soldiers with such weapons could be put into position behind stone or earth walls. Then it was almost impossible to defeat them. Most American generals, however, seemed unable to accept this. They continued to use the old methods of attack that had worked before the mini-ball was invented. Hundreds or thousands of men were put in long lines across the front of the enemy position. A signal was given. The men began to march forward. When they got close, they fired their guns. Then they ran at the enemy and struck with their knives or hands. The idea was to shock the enemy, frighten him, and make him run away. As generals on both sides learned this method no longer worked. The attackers were shot down before they could get close enough to hurt the defenders. After three and a half years of fighting, hundreds of thousands of Union and Confederate soldiers had been killed or wounded. Still, the war continued. In the East, Union armies were slowly pushing forward toward their main target. That was the Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia. In the West, Union armies were slowly pushing deeper into Confederate territory. The Western armies were led by General William Sherman. Sherman had two goals. One was to capture the city of Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta was one of the few remaining industrial cities of the Confederacy. The other goal was to destroy the Confederate army led by General Joe Johnston. Sherman's army was stronger than Johnston's army, but the Confederates usually got into better defensive positions. Sherman refused to attack in such situations. It was easier to march around the Confederates and force them to withdraw. This happened again and again. Confederate President Jefferson Davis began to believe that General Johnston was afraid to fight. He replaced him with another general. 
Within two days, that general attacked the Union Army. The attack began without enough planning. It was based on false information. It was a disaster. In eleven days of fighting, one-third of the Confederate Army in Georgia was destroyed. The remaining force was too weak to defend Atlanta. The city fell. After capturing Atlanta, General Sherman fought a series of small battles with a Confederate force across northern Georgia. Then he decided to march to Savannah, a city on the Atlantic coast. Before leaving, his men set fire to the city. Almost all of Atlanta was destroyed. Sherman's army would continue to do this all the way to Savannah, Georgia, 350 kilometers away. It cut a path of destruction more than 100 kilometers wide. This campaign would be known as Sherman's March to the Sea. Sherman said he wanted to make the people of Georgia suffer. He said he wanted to show the people of the Confederacy that their government could not protect them. Union soldiers stopped at every farm and village. They took food and clothing. They took horses, cows, and other farm animals. What they could not take or did not want, they destroyed. They set fire to houses and farm buildings. They burned crops. They destroyed stores and factories. They burned bridges and pulled up railroad tracks. Day by day, the Union Army of General William Sherman cut and burned its way across Georgia. The Army faced little opposition. Small groups of Confederate horse soldiers struck at the edges of the army, but they did little damage. On December 22, 1864, Sherman reached Savannah. He sent a message to President Abraham Lincoln in Washington. He said, I beg to present you as a Christmas holiday gift the city of Savannah. Sherman's campaign had cut a great wound in the heart of the Confederacy. All that remained were the states of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. His march to the sea had a great destructive effect on the spirit of the South. Sherman's army rested in Savannah for a month. Then, on February 1st, 1865, it began to move north. The goal was to join General Ulysses Grant outside the Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia. As Sherman's army moved across South Carolina, it destroyed almost everything in sight. The soldiers remembered that South Carolina had been the first state to rebel and leave the Union. They remembered that South Carolina had fired the first shots of the war. This time, against orders, they destroyed the land they left behind. Confederate forces could not stop them. The same thing happened in the Shenandoah River Valley northwest of Richmond. In the early years of the war, Confederate forces had moved through the valley to strike northern territory. They had invaded Maryland and Pennsylvania and had threatened Washington from there. General Grant decided that the Confederates had used the Shenandoah Valley long enough. He sent some of his men into the valley. He ordered them to destroy everything that might be of use to the enemy. Eat up, Virginia, he said. 
clear and clean as far as you can go. Farms were burned. Crops were destroyed. Farm animals were taken away or killed. Nothing was left that could feed a man or animal. Nothing but blackened earth. Then General Grant sent General Philip Sheridan into the Shenandoah Valley. Sheridan's army battled its way through the valley in the autumn of 1864. It gained victory after victory against a smaller, weaker Confederate force. By the end of the year, Union troops had complete control of the valley. The only Confederate power that remained was the army of General Robert E. Lee. With the Shenandoah Valley closed to the Confederates, food supplies fell very low. There was almost nothing to feed the soldiers in Lee's army. Wagons would go out each day in search of food. They returned almost empty. More and more Confederate soldiers were running away. Some returned to their homes. Others surrendered to Union forces. Confederate leaders no longer could find soldiers to take the places of those who left. Men would not answer the army's call. There was, however, a huge labor force in the South that the army had not called. Slaves. Slaves had been used to do non-military work for the army. They had built roads and bridges. They had driven wagons. But they had not served as soldiers. In the North, thousands of free Negroes served in the Union Army, but they received less pay than white soldiers. Confederate lawmakers finally began to discuss the idea of using slaves as soldiers. A bill was proposed that would free any slave who joined the army to fight. Many southern leaders opposed the bill, even if it would save the Confederacy. Said one, Do not arm the slaves. The day you make them soldiers is the beginning of the end of the revolution. If slaves make good soldiers, our whole idea of slavery is wrong. General Robert E. Lee did not agree. He believed slaves could be made into good soldiers if they believed they had an interest in Confederate victory. He proposed giving immediate freedom to any slave who joined the army. The Confederate Congress passed a bill in March of 1865 to accept Negroes as soldiers. The bill did not promise to free them. By then, however, it was too late. An army of freed slaves could not be trained in time to save the Confederacy. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.